Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series, made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michaela Hall, director of the library. I want to thank you all for being here today and to give special thanks to Margaret Gibson and all of our guest poets for offering this program tonight and for all the hard work they have put into it. I also want to thank Carla Umlin, our assistant director, Belinda Decay, our director emeritus, and the rest of the staff um, for their support in organizing the event. We again ask that all participants please keep your cameras off and your microphones muted unless asked by myself to turn them on. And this will just help ensure there's no interference during the presentation. If you have any questions throughout the meeting, please type them in the chat. All questions will be answered when we open up Q&A at the end. And if you have a question for a specific poet, please include their name with your question. I am recording the program, but all personal information, such as names of participants, will be edited out before we upload it to our YouTube channel. And we will let you all know when it is available on YouTube. I now turn it over to our Director Emeritus, Belinda Decay. Thank you, Michaela. And I just want to thank our incredible support team at the library. I mean, this really is amazing what they do, Carla and Ivy, and um, it's, it's, just, it's just wonderful because um, they have enormous skill at Zoom, and uh, which we still have to do. So it really couldn't be more appropriate in April Poetry Month to welcome our special guest and longtime friend of the library, Margaret Gibson, the Poet Laureate of Connecticut, Professor Emerita at UConn, recipient of many awards and author of several books of poetry, and someone who has devoted her life to teaching poetry and to writing it. And um, it really is an enormous privilege to have her here this evening and something we've been waiting for for some time, thanks to the pandemic and everything. <laughs> so welcome, welcome, Margaret. Um, but I know that uh, your time as Poet Laureate has been largely devoted to showing how poetry can make a difference to our understanding of the envir environment and the climate crisis that we're waiting. And it's, it's been a wonderful work and the product of this work has been this amazing anthology and the gathering of poets that we have today. I think this is the first time I can remember having having such a gathering of guests. So thank you, Margaret, for pulling this together. I can't imagine the work that's it and devotion that it has involved. Um, and I just, before handing it over to you, because I know you want to introduce your program and explain what it is and all your poets, I just want to say that um, we're looking forward to the publication of your next book of poems um, in the late summer, I think. And we hope by then we can have an in-person gathering in our new library space. So let's hope for that. But meanwhile, thank you, Margaret, for being here. And um, everyone, welcome, Margaret, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Belinda. Um, I want to, um, to second my thanks to the team here at the Stonington Free Library. Uh, Michaela, Carla, and Ivy for all of their care and enthusiasm with which they do their essential work of bringing um, the written and spoken word to all of you out there. Um, thanks to them for Zooming us all together. And there are 82 of us uh, in the audience. Thank of you, thanks to you for, for coming and joining us. 
It's been a real pleasure for me as Connecticut's um, Poet Laureate to be involved in many projects whose intent is to bring attention to poetry and the environment. With the help of the, a grant from the Academy of American Poets and with the help of the um, Connecticut Office of the Arts, I've been able to support readings, workshops, uh, videos, and the reason we're gathered here tonight, and, and this anthology of 63 uh, Connecticut poets, uh, Waking Up to the Earth, Connecticut Poets in a Time of Global Climate Crisis. Um, the book is published by Grayson Books, and you can go to their website, www.graysonbooks.com, and order a copy. About this book, Chase Twitchell wrote, it's hard to believe that the poems in this essential collection all come out of a single small state, but make no mistake, these are not poems about Connecticut. They are poems about the world, our one and only world, and the damage we inflict on it. Ranging from expressions of profound love and intimacy with the earth and its many creatures to rage and re, uh, grief and rage at our species' self-destructive blindness. Each poem is a testament to our poets, to our planet's precariousness and a grave warning of its fragility. Waking up to the earth is a resounding wake-up call. Poets have always written about the earth. Um, in the introduction to the anthology, I point out that poetry and ecology both focus on interrelationship. A poem weaves a web of related thoughts and rhythms and images. An ecosystem is all about interdependence and the energetic relationship of all sentient beings. Sometimes people think of themselves as separate from nature um, or what we call nature. But a closer look at our relationship with the earth within the intimacy of poetic language shows that whether we are wild or rural or urban, we are not separate from nature or from the earth. We are nature. And poetry is a record of that identity. I'm going to introduce each of the nine poets here with me tonight just before he or she reads, and then you will hear for yourself poems that praise, poems that warn, poems that grieve, poems that offer the human voice in a complex relationship with the earth. Our first poet is Christy Max Williams. Christy is a writer and an actor who lives in Mystic, Connecticut. He co-founded and for many years directed the arts cafe, Mystic. Christy. Thank you, Margaret. And thanks all of you for being here tonight. The poem I'll read is called Rock Me Mama. <clears throat> it's in three parts. Each of those parts refers to a massive wildlife spectacle. That is, uh, those massings of animals that take place in the natural world uh, annually, as the case is with these three spectacles. On the migratory pathways and in the places where birth and death happen for animals, each of them has been happening, as I say, annually for millions of years. Each of them, I've had the great good fortune to witness myself, and each of them is imperiled by global climate change. Rock Me Mama, part one. Oh, mama, rock me. Rock me in the arms of your sex, your birth, your wild plenty. Rock me your full moon in May. Rock me horseshoe crabs by the millions on the beaches of Delaware Bay. Let me see the moonlight on their ancient armor as they pave the beach like countless cobbles. As the great she crabs pull trains of he crabs coupled to their engines in urgent readiness to spawn the eggs she'll lay by thousands in the wet dark sand. 
Rock me the break of day when blizzards of shorebirds shift and juke as one in crazy flight above the crabs. Sing me their names, red knots, plovers, sanderlings, and turnstones. Sing the epic journey that brings them from Tierra del Fuego bound for Arctic nesting grounds. Sing hunger, sing exhaustion, as they descend upon the bowls of crab eggs on the beach, gorging themselves on the glistening fecundity, then rising into flight with peeping cries, as they've done for a thousand, thousand full moons in May. Oh, mama, can it last? Can crabs and birds endure the rising sea, the shrinking shore? We owe you a tender cooling, mama. We owe you a cooling. Part two. Rock me, mama. Rock me in the lap of your tidal sway, your ebb and surge, your procreant surge. Rock me a long Alaskan summer day when salmon schooling by the millions, Chinook, Coho, Sockeye, Pink, surge from the sea where the years have grown them into mighty swimming muscles flexing with fertility, surging to shore in search of natal waters. Every brook, stream, and river, a salmon birthplace and destiny where they will spawn and die. Rock me the secret salmon compass painting unfailingly to home as the silent silver salmon fly swiftly through the water, then break the surface into airborne flight, slicing the horizon in flexing flight, a salmon exultation of grace, fertility, and fate, as they have done for a thousand, thousand summers. Ah, mama. Can it last? Will the salmon's compass point through the warmer waters? Will shrinking glaciers feed their natal streams? A tender cooling, mama. You are owed a cooling. Part three. Oh, rock me, rock me, mama. Rock me with your cooing call, your lullaby of screech and howl your deep, deep quiet. Rock me a starry sky in early March. Rock me silence of the frozen banks along the Platte River in Nebraska. Let me peer through darkness at the starlit river, the wide, slow Platte, its silent, shallow current skimming over ancient mud as the horizon silvers with approaching dawn. Let me almost see the slender silhouettes. Let me in the sky's faint first pink see 10,000 silhouettes of sandhill cranes standing in the shallows. And let me hear a soft first chortle as a lone crane rises into wide-winged fight. As suddenly a thousand cranes rise as one, and a thousand, thousand, ten thousand more, lifting into flight against the pinkening sky, their collective wings a sudden whoosh, their collective chortle a mighty cry, as the sky becomes a cloud of cranes, tens of thousands wheeling a wide, wild circle, crying a deafening cry of craneness, as they have cried for a thousand, thousand dawns in March. Dear Mama, can it last? Will the Platte's wide shallows dry to silt? Will the cranes find haven here before they leave to nest in Arctic Canada? Oh, Mama, a cooling, a tender cooling. Thank you.
Thank you, Christy. Our next poet is Claire Rossini. Claire serves as artist in residence um, at Trinity College. She teaches creative writing classes and directs an outreach program that puts Trinity students in public school art classes. Claire. Thank you, Margaret, and hello to everyone from West Hartford. Um, this poem I'm about to read is actually set in the space I'm, I'm zooming from, my office in my, um, in my house, and uh, two birds are involved. One is the dusky seaside sparrow, which is extinct, um, like many birds, a victim of herbicides, and um, they actually sighted a freeway through its final nesting grounds. The last few duskies died out in the 70s. And the other bird is a local Connecticut sparrow, which happened to be chirping out my window one day. Uh, the thing that brought them together is an archive of bird songs, uh, which can be found and accessed by anyone up at Cornell. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. You just go to the Cornell uh, Ornithology Archive. You can look up the um, name of any bird, both extinct and birds that are still with us and hear their, the sounds they make. Um, there are many recordings of every bird. So I was tooling around one day in the Cornell archive. I wanted, I had been studying the dusky seaside sparrow and wanted to hear its song. So the title of the poem moves right into the first line. The song of the dusky seaside sparrow. That's the title. I'll read it again as it goes right into the first line. The song of the dusky seaside sparrow trebles through my tinny speakers, hauled in by a click of the mouse from an archive at Cornell. A sound so clear I can almost see the bird perched on a curl of Spartina grass, its body flecked with black, an extravagant streak of yellow browing each eye. Does it call to its mate or to chicks in the nest mouthing air? Some scientists say the dusky sang simply for the sake of it. Another sound raised to counter the waves polished grind and bleak withdrawals. How is it that the species that designs sparrow sides incites freeways through nesting grounds also salvages? So that with a finger's pressure on an acquiescent key, I can make an extinct bird sing. I crank up my laptop's volume, click the link there a husky spiel of notes. From the dogwood at my window, a local sparrow answers with sturdy chirrup. Again, the dusky's pearl trill, the duet going on. Thanks very much. Thank you, Claire. Jean Levasseur is our next poet. Jean is Professor Emeritus at Quinnipiac University, and she's the author of a book of poems, Planetary Nights. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to all the audience for coming. You know, there's new research that trees communicate much more than we realize, and um, the oaks are the keystone plants of the whole web of life that we rely on. And um, this poem is an homage really to Mary Oliver's great poem, um, Summer Day, and I use some of her rhetorical structures. Um, it's called Old Souls, and um, here it goes. The trees think, are there sparks in their neural network underground? Who made them so? the dogwood and the maple. 
Who made the shad blow? The June blooming dainty white one that ropes along the river when fish run their spawning marathon? And who made the speckled alder and gave it woolen cones to hang like lanterns through the winter? Or knit the hickory its shaggy bark or pieced the sycamore its quilt of buff and tan? And I have not spoken of the oak with its shapely limbs and apron full of acorns, its waxy leaves full as dinner plates for the swallows, or mentioned the quaking aspen shaking her petticoats of tufted cotton in the breeze. They make me wonder, do trees have souls? I feel a hollow spot in my chest open like a nest. If the soul begins with longing, then these roots that twine in tributaries underground, or the bird call that ruffles a canopy of leaves. This is how it starts, this longing to join one soul to another. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Dan Donahue is our next poet. He's the author of three books of poems, um, among them, uh, Somerset, which was the winner of the 2019 Patterson Prize. Um, Dan is a professor of English at um, Eastern, State, Eastern Connecticut State University. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, this is a snapshot four turkeys at the feeder. Second day of spring, I woke to four wild turkeys gobbling on cracked shells below our feeders. They brought no chaos to the morning, bright blue over the mountains, wrens picking suet as they always do and flying off, finches pulling thistle through socks, cardinals swooping back and forth for sunflower seeds. Each turkey a good 12 pounds, almost tall as my waist, same height as my daughter, who's five, who'd love to see this after school, animals from her little house books feasting right here in our yard. Another of her books taught us turkeys can fly 50 miles an hour, glide thousands of feet without flapping, scratch through six inches of ice to lift scraps of midwinter food, all instinct and shifts through resistance, all blood ritual and desire. Their eyes are three times better than ours, can spot slight movements from a hundred yards. Their gobbles travel a quarter of a mile. These turkeys, though, are, for the moment, plain as pigeons or plain as any of us who have wandered far off course and want only enough of a meal to keep going toward what we know. They eat slowly, and don't fuss. They don't strut their feathers or drag their wings on the ground. They don't scare the squirrel or woodpecker or red-winged blackbirds. They lean into each other. They pay no attention to me at the window, zooming in, zooming out, shooting only photos again and again. Thank you, Dan. Our next poet is Rhonda Ward. Uh, Rhonda served as the first poet laureate of New London, and she collaborates with visual artists on um, amazing projects, some involving the environment, another I know um, involving Black Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, Rhonda. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you everyone for being here. My poem is called Urban Aesthetic. It attempts to address the lack of green spaces in urban areas. Urban Aesthetic. I ain't got no garden. All I got is this stretch of dirt in my shortcut. A few <laughs> weeds peeking up in cross-eyed patches looking like they want to be cabbage or greens. Ain't no mountains in the ghetto. I do have a purple dress though that I look majestic in if I do say so myself. Rolling plains and fields, forget it. 
only things rolling around here is some pieces of candy wrapping and cigarette butts moving along on a whim of the wind on their way to the gutter. But beauty ain't lost on ghetto folk. We got us a foreign language we speak in English. We got hair, natural, fried, and curly. We got soul food and double Dutch and purple. We got purple. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Our next poet to read is Susan Kinsolving. Um, I'll wait till she pops up. Uh, Susan's book, Dailies and Rushes, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. And she has appeared as a guest poet in many national and international venues. Susan. Thank you. And thank you for this really extraordinary anthology. It's much to be proud of. This poem um, that I will read is a contrast between what we as humans do when one of our species vanishes, dies, as opposed to when an entire species becomes extinct. So that is the contrast. Uh, the poem is Arrangements for the Endangered. What crematorium will inter Heinz emerald dragonfly, pour those iridescent green ashes into a clear glass urn. What mortuary will lay the Jamaican boa to rest in a thin, narrow, elongated coffin? Or set on tufted satin the Sumatran rhino before installing him in the rhinoceros mausoleum? What cause of death euphemism will pass for losing the pink fairy armadillo or the African wild ass? Where is the priest to offer last rites to St. Vincent's parrot or the rabbi to bury Koch's pita? What cortege can attend all 23 sea turtles, eight different whales, 15 extravagant pheasants? Must 18 monkeys fit into one simian crypt? How to embalm all those butterflies. What eulogy for the clawless Cameroon otter? Who will write an ob obituary for the Alabama beach mouse? Or offer epitaphs for Bulmer's fruit bat, the Tampico pearly mussel, the Oahu tree snail, every black jaguar, every last gorilla. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Jose B. Gonzalez is our next poet. Jose is the author of Toys Made of Rock and When Love Was Reels. He's a Fulbright scholar, and his poetry has been published in the Norton Introduction to Literature. Jose. All right, thank you, Margaret. And uh, what a great day to be listening to um, wonderful poetry. You know, my first, uh, I have two poems in this collection. I'm fortunate enough to uh, have that. But um, this poem is really about, you know, how I came to learn, right? I mean, for so many of us, it's, it's kind of organic, but for some of us, you kind of learn this appreciation for earth and knowledge and whatnot. Um, so this one's called, And Then I Read About, Another Confession. Before she left earth, I never asked her to teach me about earth. So I read books about planting 
and I learned about water and how much was too little and how much could kill the roots. And I understood why she left El Salvador's earthquakes. And then I started to read books about soil and how crops should be moved. And I understood why she had no choice but to move Yanni and me. And then I read about landslides mm -hmm. and I understood why she brought her mother and her sister to live with us. And then I read about deforestation and how only Haiti was worse than our old country. And then I remembered how they said that she looked toward the sky when she took her last breath. And then I looked at the trees and saw what her eyes had dreamed. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Our next poet is Edwina Trentum. Um, Ed, Edwina is or was, well, she is a professor emerita of English at S. Nuntuck Community College, where she founded the poetry journal Fresh Water. Her book of poems, Stumbling into the Light, was published by Antrim, Antrim House. Uh, Edwina. Um, the poem I'm going to read is called Bedtime Story. And um, I wrote this poem probably five, four or five years ago, maybe when I heard this, the trees were dying, of course, because the trees are dying. And um, I heard this voice in my head that said, there once were these beautiful things called trees. And I imagined someone in the future telling these bedtime stories. And so this is the first of a heroic crown of sonnets on this subject, which is 14 poems, 15 poems, 15 sonnets. Anyway, here it is. Bedtime story. There once were these beautiful things called trees. Their branches in greens you cannot dream or imagine feathered the sky. At times still, then hushing, rustling, caught by a breeze, leaves turning red, gold, brown before they fell then glowing pink along a tracery of black in spring, which used to come between the hollow white darkness we call winter and summer's wildfires. But we wanted more, then more, of everything. So they dried to dust, gave up on us deep in their cores, thundered to the earth, tearing up the dead tangles of their massive roots. Sleep now, sleep. Tomorrow, I will tell you about bees. Thank you, Edwina. Um, our next poet is Mary Guitar. Uh, Mary is well published in anthologies and journals and was the winner of the Al Savard Memorial Poetry Competition sponsored by the Connecticut Poetry Society. Mary Guitar. Thank you, Margaret. And thanks for everybody in the audience. Um, I started this poem a couple of years ago when things felt particularly bleak. And I've been working on it ever since. And I, but I think it's actually a poem about hope um, in the end and some of the twists and turns it may take to get there. At the end of Empire. Number one, falling. Looking out across the horizon, I imagine the American empire itself enfolded in that stately snarl of purple clouds, sailing toward me, about to crash into sheer rock face. Here, the air glows, granite boulders pulse with a meaning that words no longer contain. The wind smells of rain falling on dry soil, an ozone, slippery and sharp. And then it is upon us, air, no longer air, but water, colors streaming, peonies melting, foxgloves bowing, roses pressing their drenched faces against the trellis. Lightning reveals all things in negative, Every card reversed, one bright flash dealt out, then another. 
then wind moves through dark trees. Take that, or that, or leave it. Two, rising. Last night in a crowded dream, I looked out across a long green field. The sky, sooty yellow, darkened into twilight. Something waited. As we watched, five, ten, one hundred, immense glowing sky lanterns slowly rose, drifted upward, buoyed by the flaming candles tucked inside, great loops of rope suspended below them. On each rope was a young monk, silently holding on, sometimes two balanced together, touching shoulders, heads shaved, torsos, saffron robes blowing, they faced forward and resolutely squared their shoulders. We couldn't see their faces, but knew they were not afraid. We watched and the animals watched until their lights were as small as stars. Then we prepared to follow. Three, leading. What we know of the world could be balanced on the carapace of this beetle with the pink face stripes, or on the stately dowager beauty of the faded wild columbine, upright but deconstructing, and on the lazy questions and answers of birds at twilight. The obedient grass bows over paths we've beaten to reach this place where the air still smells of honeysuckle and water and truth. Safety nests under the brambles, but not, nowhere else. Here, we must know the predators, their beauty, their disguises, the deep, the deep reach of their sight and hearing, and know that some of us will die in their mouths. This moon, this scrap of eyelash caught in bare branches is tonight the only thing that lifts our hearts. Once freed from the treetops, it chases the stars, those hieroglyphs hinting at the nature of life behind the scrim, transient glances, fugitive color, like the signal lights of great ships or the green flash of fireflies pulsing in an unknown code. Four, grieving. The pain sinks deep into muscles strained on the rough trek into the rocky cavern we did not know we contained and have not mapped. Some of us are confused, some outraged. Some insist that life is still spinning in a pure and predetermined orbit. If we could hold our grief in our arms like a newborn, would we see its other face, our love for the world? When grief rises behind my tongue into my throat, I open my mouth and utter words in a language I have never studied. The void offers up genus and species. The flavors of the world roll under the tongue, sweet, Salty, sharp, pungent, piercing. They pulse in our pleasure center centers until we are sated. The little blue schizochirium scoparium stings my calves as I pick early berries, while the secret names tungle, tumble off my tongue so that they may live in the air a little longer. Buteo jamasensis, red tailed hawk. Dippling, dipping and circling. The caterpillar, Origia leucostigma, so voracious, so toxic, so beautiful, it may be erased if I do not say its name with appropriate solemnity, or even if I do. Five, and what follows? In the garden, green beans still punctuate the trellis with hopeful commons. And at the edge of the cornfield, the sun's last eloquent glance 
burnishes the black raspberries. Listen, the rusting engines that lie in the ground below us flash like distant heat lightning, like fireflies, like code. Listen, I think we must unfold our grief and find the sharp shard wrapped inside the bundle. Six, and again. Beside us, the elders carved sweeping lines into the rock with the sharp shards of our grief, incised flowing shapes that remind us of peaceful mornings, of evenings when there is plenty, keeping untouched what is carved there already, and the empty wall around the corner. Thank you, Mary. Um, I want to offer my thanks to all of the poets who, this, this wonderful selection of poets um, from the um, anthology. I um, was prepared to read a shorter poem. The poem of mine in the anthology is rather long, but I think we have enough time. Um, so I'm going to read Irrevocable. Irrevocable is in my new book, The Glass Globe, which, um, as Belinda mentioned, is um, going to be published in August of this year. Um, this is a book that begins with a poem called Washing the Body, um, a poem um, that describes um, washing my late husband David McCain's body along with his um, son and daughter right after he had died. Um, I think it, it's understandable, um, our grief for those particular people we love, um, particular friends, particular family, but how to express a grief for the entire earth. And it, it, I just, one day it just said, well, wash the body of the earth um, with the same particularity and care that you would wash um, the body or did wash the body of your late husband. So I wrote the poem called Irrevocable. Um, it is a kind of elegy to the earth, but it focuses a lot on um, our human civilization as it is now. And it's intended to have us focus, I hope, on all that we have created, um, some of it uh, positive, some not so positive. Um, that will also vanish, that will vanish. The poem is called Irrevocable. Someone no longer alive is hovering over a great expanse of smart weed, panic grass, and midden where a house used to be, whose trees and gardens once flourished, where puddles and ponds held the sky and a cloud's uh, and clouds and stars in place for a moment. And you lived there, ah, my dear. I speak from the liminal space where your beloved's last barely audible breath slipped into your body, then out the window into the winter chill, whose horizon line rolled up as if it were twine into a point, a still point, a full stop that opens the heart. From that point, I speak. As once you wash the body of your beloved, let us wash for the last time this one earth, this only and only once, for once and for all earth, as if it were a lover who has died, and we, not knowing what to do, at last must wash the poles north and south, where long ago the ice cracked open, sheared off, and melted. Last, the mountain peaks. Last, the crowns of oaks and maples on whose bare branches long strips of torn plastic flutter. Also the steeples, the turrets, the domes. Last, the open fields and meadows, wash them clean the vast desert and its last oasis, riverbeds and shrunken rills, ravines and gullies, the rocky promontories from which we viewed the sea as it rose to cover the cities. At last, the cities, submerged full fathom 
or in low tide, only the towers and the tips of the high rises winking up. Last, the sidewalks, shop windows, market stalls. Last, pebble, shell, and skull. Last, lark and satellite, wash them, and the field of broken mirrors. Last, the house. Last, the bed. Last, the hills of Midden and their treasures, a button, a seed, a feather, a zipper, a chip of a china plate. Last, the nose cone, the black box. Last, the trawler, the landing gear, the microchip, the missing part. Last, the kiva, the sweat lodge, the drum. Last, prayer rugs, the pews, the cushions. Last, the factories, the foundries, the mills, the maze of subway tunnels, the turnstiles. Last, the eye of the needle through which we could not pass. Last, a gun, a mine, a missile. Last, a bridge. Last, middle C on the piano. Last, a cello, a violon cello, in particular, the sonata for violon cello number two in D. Precarious, because it was the last music you listened to. Precious, because like the last word your beloved spoke, you didn't know it was last. Last, the pattern of fish displayed on ice and their many-eyed, one-eyed gaze. Last, the last whale beached on a shore at Truro. Last, the glint of an eye in the periwinkle, the lovely sinuous ripple of a reclusive snake. Last, the chemicals, the vitamins, the pills, the chemicals. Last, a hearing aid, a pair of binoculars, a surgeon's knife, a sling, a robotic hand. Last, to list only a few from the multitude that perished, fox and laughing gull, swallowtail and hawk, lion, panther, giraffe, mosquito, trillium, hummingbird, hibiscus, owl. Last, the very last line in a poem by Rilke, the line you can't forget the ache of, the line you didn't enact, not one syllable of it. You must change your life. Space, of course, lasts. I walk on it as one would walk on a tablecloth for a table no one will set. What's left of my eyesight has dimmed. What I hear is only wind and that muted. And because I have nothing to write on, I build cairn after cairn, lifting stones, balancing them, touching what remains in place as if it were a new alphabet or a sentence in Braille. You are reading the last of the Earth's last rivers and mountains. Do you know that? These stones, these silences, the last words held in mind for a moment, as if they were a net of fireflies shimmering in a summer field one can't tell apart from a night sky and stars. Wash them. Wash each stone, each firefly. Wash them clean. This one a love cry, that one a lament, and the last one the wing of a warning you still might be able to hear just as once, long ago, you caught the smoke of the oracle rising from a rift zone at the center in the earth. And if these cairns, these stone syllables survive, there may be no one left to read the poem they make. But if by chance there is, let the stones be read aloud so that a human voice might widen its reach, floating off into the stars like the ringing through of a great bronze bell, like the audible layers of birdsong gradually moving west as dawn brightens 
or used to, and the great earth turns. Again, I want to thank everyone who has, uh, all the poets who gathered today to read, um, and to thank the audience who is here with us, all 82 of you. And to send this back to Carla, I think, who's going to um, moderate questions. Thank you so much, Margaret. So yes, and thank you, Margaret, and all the poets tonight. So if anyone has any questions for any of the poets, please go right ahead and ask them in the chat.